You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Flash movie breakdown Easter eggs for the entire movie. There's so many references and stuff that's happening in real life with James Gunn's reboot that they try to tie into the movie, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. Real big spoiler warning if you haven't seen the movie yet because we'll be talking about everything. The movie is intended to be a bookend for the Snyderverse of characters, even though Aquaman 2 is coming out later this year and Blue Beetle. Technically, Blue Beetle will be like the first new character that James Gunn recognizes as being part of his DCU. Some of the Snyderverse DCEU actors will continue in the DCU, but they'll be like alternate universe versions of their characters. They'll retune the backstories as they need to in the new movies. There are a couple of moments in the Flash movie where they call us out specifically, so I'll point them out as we get to those parts of the film. But quick history lesson too, because the Flash movie, of all the DC movies that they've been doing the last many, many years, since they've been doing DC movies in general, has been one of the longest running DC movies that's been stuck in development hell since the 1980s. That's right, they were going to make a Flash movie, or they tried to, before they made Michael Keaton's 1989 Batman movie. Very apropos because Michael Keaton's Batman is a big part of this movie. They also released this movie almost to the day 10 years from when they released the Man of Steel movie, which is big to the plot of the film as well. Literally this week, 10 years ago, Henry Cavill's Superman movie came out starting the Snyderverse of movies. So they're starting the Snyderverse and ending the Snyderverse in the same week. That original 1980s version of the Flash movie was going to be written by Jeff Loeb, who most of you remember as the writer of a lot of Batman's best stories like The Long Halloween. Eventually, Adam Brody became a version of the movie Flash in George Miller's Justice League Mortal movie in the early 2000s. That fell apart, then Zack Snyder eventually came on to do the Man of Steel movie with Henry Cavill's Superman, and that began the Snyderverse, where they started to make the modern Flash movie. That went through about four different directors and was originally supposed to come out in 2018. Remember this original schedule everybody cried remember what we might have seen had this all worked out until they found Andy Muschietti the director and they settled on doing a version of Flashpoint combined with Batman into the Batverse there are so many versions of Batman in this movie I freeze I'm Batman but starting at the beginning of the movie, they actually deleted a bunch of scenes from the original opening you probably saw in all the trailers. There was a longer scene where Flash was getting his breakfast order and the clerk makes him wait while he's getting calls from Ben Affleck's Batman to come help in Gotham City while he's watching Henry Cavill's Superman on the TV while he's trying to figure out where to go around the Earth, which Justice League member to help. Originally, the movie was about four hours long. There were a bunch, a bunch of cameo scenes from other Justice League actors like Henry Cavill's Superman scenes. There was an alternate post credit scene, just a bunch of stuff in general that hit the cutting room floor. So I'll do a completely separate video about that this weekend. Most of the changes they made to the movie were because of James Gunn's reboot. They kind of had to retune things so they could use this as a bookend for Ezra Miller in the Justice League Snyderverse. In the theatrical version, they just wanted a quicker, more action-packed opening scene. So they just start with him running straight to Gotham in the new version of the Flash suit, which they gave him in a prequel comic book. Ben Affleck's Batman is the one who created the Flash ring, which is from the comics. They used it on the Flash TV show a bunch of times, who also made the Flash suit. I think there were some deleted scenes in the original version of the movie where Ray Fisher's cyborg would have been part of this too, until they took him out of the film. One of the most noticeable things in the movie is the way The Flash runs, too. They doubled down on the Zack Snyder Snyderverse method, and he said that it's meant to look kind of like The Flash is swimming through the Speed Force instead of traditional running like Grant Gustin's Flash does. <laughs> it's one of those love it or hate it kind of things, like why does The Flash run so weird? They even joke about it later in the movie when he loses his powers and kind of tries to swim run around in circles, screaming. One of the other noticeable things, too, is with the younger version of Barry, when he gets powers, he runs normally like Grant Gustin's Flash. He doesn't do the weird swim running that the older version of Flash does. Part of the joke there is also they want to say that this younger Barry is theoretically or could become a better version of the Flash than the older version of Barry. He runs normally, he learns stuff way faster, he becomes even quicker as the Flash, like he gets more powerful way faster. And if you never realize it, Central City of the comics is located in the Midwest. Gotham City is right next to Metropolis on the East Coast, which is why it looks like he has to run so far to get to Gotham. Ben Affleck's Batman literally rolls in on his new bat cycle to take down Carmine Falcone's crew, which has stolen a deadly virus from the hospital, then blasted their way out, causing the destruction that the Flash has to fix. Some of the upgrades with the new suit from the Justice League movie in the Peacemaker series is that it dissipates static energy that the Flash builds as he runs. Make all the static shock jokes that you want. 
Later in the movie, they use this for a big joke with a younger version of Barry who makes a Star Wars Emperor Palpatine joke like the Emperor from Star Wars, I'll just give it off and he starts shocking people with Speed Force energy. And speaking of everybody getting new suits, Ben Affleck's Batman gets a new Batman suit. This version is meant to be closer to the comics, the blue and gray suit with modern technology. Like it's his suit, but it's a version of the blue and gray suit. They also reveal the Flash has started using an energy meter to measure how much energy he has left before he needs to refuel himself by consuming more calories. They actually turned that into a much bigger joke during the movie too. The whole idea of him being a snack hole, as he said during the Justice League film. During his big save, while he's in the Speed Force, as he starts to lose energy, he literally breaks into a falling vending machine to just eat as much candy as possible, even microwaving burritos, which are in the middle of falling through the sky. He tells Alfred, who also has a big cameo in the movie, that he's the janitor of the Justice League. When the hospital actually collapses, they make a reference to a literal baby shower, like it's showering babies. In most of the Flash's early action scene, it's just meant to show you what he can do, how he uses his powers in the Speed Force, and just for comedy in general. There were so many people posting memes of him putting the baby in the microwave in reverse. So if you see microwaving babies on social media, that's what it's from. They wind up reusing footage of this slow motion Speed Force action scene with them all falling in the therapy dog later for the actual end credits. One of the weird things though, like if you really dig into this slow motion action scene of him saving all the babies, especially with the microwave here, is that when he lands and reveals them to the nurse who's still freaking out, is that the microwave actually dings reminding him to take the baby out as if he actually turned it on while they were falling. Like wait a minute, were you almost accidentally going to microwave that baby? He makes fun of the Justice League again, saying that they're terrible at dealing with mental health, which is ironic in real life because of everything that's happened with Ezra Miller getting in trouble with the law, having a lot of real life mental health issues himself. My name is Ezra Miller, and I am criminally excited to be a part of the Justice League. Kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. And as Batman tries to grab the virus falling off of the bridge, Wonder Woman saves them, arriving with the lasso of truth, also causing Batman to start burying his soul like the joke from the Justice League with Aquaman. Batman starts spouting about his innate childhood trauma, says his ego is far too big to say thank you to Wonder Woman, and that using his vast wealth to just donate money to worthy causes would be far more effective at stopping crime than him ever being Batman would. Flash also touches the lasso of truth, causing him to start talking about being a virgin still. I think there were meant to be more Wonder Woman scenes that they wound up deleting, but as part of like the Henry Cavill deleted Superman cameo scenes and post credit scenes they got rid of. When he goes back to finish the scene with the barista getting his breakfast order, the conversation that he's in the middle of, also referencing not living in the past anymore, is meant to set up Barry's big turn in the Flashpoint twist in the movie. There are a lot of characters in the movie that repeat lines of dialogue like this, like learn to let it go, learn when to move on, don't live in the past. Because for a large portion of the movie, he is literally stuck in the past. They go to the Central City Police Department, which they featured on the Flash TV show for a long, long time. He's working as a CSI now. It's been a couple years since the events of the Justice League movie. They also introduced the movie version of Patty Spivett and Albert Desmond, who they used on the Flash TV show as well. During the comics, Patty Spivett eventually becomes a version of Hot Pursuit, and Albert Desmond is a version of Dr. Alchemy that Tom Felton played during season three. When he's examining the yellow gloves, and later in the movie, both versions of his younger selves are wearing yellow, along with the circumstances of his mother's death, all meant to be references to the reverse Flash. Like, lots of yellow. Even the director, Andy Muschietti, did a drawing of the reverse Flash and posted it on his Instagram. That's the beauty of all this. I didn't do any of it. <laughs> you did. The whole idea in the movie is that Reverse Flash is the person who killed Barry's mother, but they never actually show Reverse Flash, like they never cast an actor. I think if they wind up doing more Flash stuff during James Gunn's DCU, then we'll see Reverse Flash for real. They bring back Iris West from the Justice League movie. They make a few references to that as well, sort of canonizing those events, which were deleted scenes in the theatrical cut, but they put back in for the Snyder cut. Batman sends him the CCTV footage taken from the day his mother was killed, and at this point, because he hasn't changed things, the footage doesn't pick up his father's face, so his father is stuck in prison. When they flash back to young Barry with his mother, he's wearing a yellow Scooby-Doo t-shirt. Fun fact, in real life, James Gunn, who is now like the Kevin Feige of DC movies and responsible for this big DC reboot, wrote both of the original live-action Scooby-Doo movies. They were like his first real big budget movies that he worked on in Hollywood. His mother also tells young Barry, not every problem has a solution. Sometimes you have to let it go and learn when to walk away. 
One of the other many references in the movie to him literally having to do this at the end of the film, like learn to walk away from this universe because you can't save it. You notice they recast his father as Ron Livingston from the Justice League movie. Billy Crudup had a scheduling conflict just because the movie had several delays, but originally he was going to continue playing Barry's father. During the movie, he also says run, Barry, run, which is right out of the Flash TV show, even though Grant Gustin doesn't actually get a cameo scene that I could spot, which absolutely sucks. That was one of the only things that I really did not like about the movie. There were a couple issues I had with it, but that was one of the biggest ones. Stop Barry Allen. No! What does that mean? How can this... This should be impossible now. It should be impossible now? How do you have all these multiverse cameos and still not have a Grant Gustin cameo? When they show young Barry in his room, he has a Star Wars Death Star toy. The circular shape of the Death Star is meant to be a reference to the way he perceives realities in the Speed Force and alternate universes, which he calls the Chrono Bowl. The whole idea is that each alternate universe is represented by a different Chrono Bowl. Then he travels into the Speed Force, arriving at the Chrono Bowl. You notice that the depiction of the Speed Force is the same from the Justice League Snyder Cut. But the way they're treating this is that he's traveling so fast, he perceives his own timeline. So like the chrono bolt around him here, this circular area, is just his own timeline relative to him, all the events of his life that he's seeing from the past. So for instance, if Batman traveled into the Speed Force like this and looked into the chrono bowl, he'd only see moments from his life, like he'd see his parents' death in Crime Alley again. The reason why the Flash doesn't see stuff like that is because he's only seeing moments from his own timeline, things that he actually experienced in the past. So when they have all the other cameo scenes, which I'll talk about later, those are meant to be other people's timelines, completely alternate universes. They're going with kind of a Loki explainer for how the timelines work during the movie. The way they're doing it in the Marvel movies is that some timelines are closely related. Like in the Marvel movies, it looks kind of like Batman's spaghetti explainer. One of the few things I didn't like about their explanation for how time travel works, at least in the DCEU here for this movie, is the way that him changing the timeline, say his mother's death, also affects moments from before that in the timeline. You could do like 10 different videos just about how time travel works because in real life it's still theoretical. So there are a bunch of scientists arguing about what the correct explainer for time travel would be. They make a lot of Back to the Future references in the movie too because the plot is very similar to the Back to the Future plot. But in the Marvel movies, they also call out Back to the Future as a very poor explainer for how time travel really works. Later, Batman also says the same thing too, like, you probably saw a movie where someone explained how time travel works, but that was wrong. That was meant to be a dig at the Back to the Future movies for how time travel works. Like, no, 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 it wouldn't work like that in real life. The better way to think about it in the movie, because we're talking about DC, in the DC universe, they have a concept called hyper time, which is like the sum total for all possibilities, any different number of timelines. Per the Batman Spaghetti Explainer, he causes a bunch of those timelines to overlap, so not everything from those original timelines is the way that it used to be in their original timelines. So it's Michael Keaton Batman's timeline overlapping with Supergirl's timeline, overlapping with Henry Cavill's Superman timeline, overlapping with the main Justice League timeline. Just a bunch of Justice League timeline soup. When he tells Batman what he's done going back in time a day, he gives him the whole flashpoint explainer like, this is why you do not do that because you will destroy everything, which he almost winds up doing. He literally almost causes the entire multiverse to collapse on itself by the end of the film. You notice he offers to save Batman's parents from being killed by Joe Chill in Crime Alley. Then Batman tries to explain how the tragedy defined him and helped him to become a better person. Like, I would never have become Batman, and because of all the good things that I do as Batman, the world is ultimately a better place. And if you undid that, I would have never become Batman, so theoretically, things would be way worse. A lot of this is out of the comic book version of Flashpoint, the original version. They did a Justice League Flashpoint movie, which was pretty close to that comic book version, too. One of the big similarities between Batman and Flash are that they both lost their parents. When Iris West comes to visit him at his apartment, there's an Easter egg for the It movie and Pennywise in the background. Andy Muschietti got his job on the Flash movie because of his work on both It movies. You notice in his fridge, he's got a big belly burger cup. That's a big chain in DC Comics. They featured it in all the Arrowverse TV shows, and they just had a big belly burger Easter egg during the Blue Beetle trailer. The poster on his wall here is from the movie One Million BC, which is just a reference to his time travel into the past. Then when he travels back into the past to save his mother, there's a Henry Cavill cameo scene from the Justice League movie, several cameo scenes and scenes from the Justice League Snyder Cut where they're all fighting him at his statue, along with Aquaman, Ben Affleck's Batman, also from the events of that movie. 
there was a small retcon to the Justice League Snyder Cut. You may have noticed here when he visits his father at Iron Heights prison, which is also from the comics during the movie, they swapped in Ron Livingston so that it all makes sense. Like, oh yeah, Ron Livingston has always been his father. As he continues traveling back along his own timeline, he sees his hard suit from Justice League, his very first proto flash suit, which you see in a flashback later in the movie. This was the original accident that gave him his powers, and he's traveling basically to the early 2000s, about 20 years ago. He puts the can of tomatoes in his mother's shopping cart so that she won't wind up needing them and won't wind up being killed. And as he travels back to the future, to make another Back to the Future reference, he gets pushed out of the Speed Force by the Dark Flash exactly 10 years ago, saying that he did it this way because he wanted to force Barry to create him, create a bootstrap paradox where he caused his own creation. The movie is referring to him as Dark Flash, but he's basically like a Savitar version of Barry. He's meant to be the alternate future version of this younger Barry who just kept trying to find different ways to save Supergirl and his mother from Zod for hundreds and hundreds of years. But the reason why his speed force lightning has become purple is just because he's gotten more powerful faster as he's gotten older. His crazy looking suit is meant to be the accumulation of Kryptonian weapons and plating that's been embedded in his body through all the different battles he's had across the hundreds of years. It's also meant to be partially inspired by the look of the Daniel West reverse Flash from the New 52 who looked like a more monstrous version of the Flash. So he punches him out of the Speed Force to exactly 10 years ago to the week as Zod is attacking during the events of the Man of Steel movie and a few hours before he initially got his powers. He's playing on the idea that this version of Barry will feel compelled to help his younger self get powers, not knowing whether or not it will affect his powers in the future. But the thing is, he would have totally been fine not giving the younger Barry powers, because remember, when he changed the past, he created a branch timeline, so he would have been able to keep his powers. They have a couple jokes about this when he's trying to figure it out, like, will this affect me in the future? I don't know. Let's not worry about it. I'll just give myself powers just to be safe. Going to have dinner with his parents again is also right out of the Flash TV show where Grant Gustin's Flash is able to have dinner with his parents again in the past. The spaghetti this time is also meant to be foreshadowing for Batman's spaghetti explainer later in the movie. When he meets his younger self, notice he's wearing yellow, more verse Flash Easter eggs, even though he's not really in the movie. And in his bedroom, because this is 10 years ago, there's movie posters from around that period, like a Christopher Nolan Inception poster, because that movie would have come out around this time. Also, Christopher Nolan in real life did the Dark Knight Batman trilogy with Christian Bale, and he was executive producer helping Zack Snyder on the Man of Steel Superman movie, which is big to the plot of this film. The reason for the Pacific Rim poster is because it came out around this time too, but also in real life, Andy Muschietti got big help from Guillermo del Toro, who took him under his wing and helped him make his very first movie in Hollywood, so he's honoring him with a small reference. When younger Barry asks if he has a plane that goes underwater or a boat that can fly, that's a reference to both Batman's vehicles from George Clooney's Batman and Robin, the Bat Boat, because he travels to this universe at the end of the movie as well. You can also think of it as a reference to Michael Keaton's new Bat Jet, which also flies through the waterfall. Where does he get those wonderful toys? When he recreates the original accident that gave him powers using the same storm, same lightning bolt, he gets struck again, taking his powers away. They also use the tooth falling out joke at the end of the movie again with George Clooney's Batman, but the difference is, is that at the end of the movie, he still has his powers, so it falls out just because of the stress of realizing that he messed up the timeline again, like, oh my god, who's this guy? You're not Batman. Oh no, what have I done? By the events of the post credit scene, short time jump later, his tooth has grown back, just confirming that he still has his powers on this alternate Earth. When they go back to this other Barry's apartment, you notice on the computer monitor nearby, there's a Looney Tunes picture. That's mostly meant to play into the whole Dark Flash twist with the Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote relationship, and Speedy Gonzalez, which he makes a joke about right after this while he's testing his powers. Zoom in and enhance, you also notice there's a Mars Attacks poster behind him, which is meant to be a reference to Zod and the Kryptonians attacking from the other planet. Then they start making the Back to the Future movie joke, setting up the way that he's changed this timeline with all the Eric Stoltz references. It's a huge deep cut in real life because Eric Stoltz was originally cast as Marty McFly in that first Back to the Future movie. He filmed a bunch of the movie, then they fired him and hired Michael J. Fox to replace him. When Zod attacks, he has another flashback scene explaining what he was doing during the events of the Man of Steel movie. They kind of did a version of this during the beginning of Batman v Superman with Ben Affleck's Batman to explain what he was doing while that was happening. 
He also explains Henry Cavill's Superman and what happened with the DCEU version of the Man of Steel movie. Like, we need to find Superman, he can take care of Zod and the Kryptonians. Turns out he's way more powerful than all these Flashes, Batman, and Supergirl all put together. Because probably one of the biggest twists of the movie is that no matter what they do, all of them are not powerful enough to stop Zod. During the movie, even though it gets really serious in the second half of the film, they make a lot of references to this too, like Henry Cavill's Superman being the Giga Chad version of Superman. We really need him. He's the person that can solve all these problems. When he meets younger Barry's roommates, they're all his friends from the DCEU, Patty Spivitt, Albert Desmond, and Gary, but they're all just way more chill versions of the characters. He learns Cyborg hasn't become Cyborg yet, he's still a football player at Gotham City University. The Wonder Woman they use for this joke here seems familiar, but I couldn't spot her. If you think you know who this is, just write it below in the comments. The magic with the rabbit in the hat is also a Zatanna reference. You notice Albert Desmond is wearing a Gremlins 2 t-shirt, but because this is an alternate universe, one of the things that they changed is that in the Gremlins movie, it says you're not supposed to feed them after 12 p.m. noon instead of feeding them after midnight. There's a cameo scene from Tamura Morrison's Thomas Curry reprising his role from the Aquaman movies, but in this reality, he never met Atlanta, his mother, and he wound up naming his dog Arthur, which is an Indiana Jones reference. We named the dog Indiana. Then they reveal Michael J. Fox is the person who starred in Footloose here instead of Kevin Bacon, and Kevin Bacon starred in Top Gun as Maverick, but they never actually say which movies Tom Cruise wound up doing in this reality. They reveal they do know about Batman with Patty Spivitt repeating the line from the movie I'm Batman and burping from the 1989 film setting up the joke later when Michael Keaton repeats it. You're... you are... Yeah. I'm Batman. Where are you? I'm Batman. When they arrive at the Wayne Mansion, it's designed exactly like Michael Keaton's Wayne Mansion from his movies, but they're treating it like only the Batman 1989 movie and Batman Returns are canon to his character. In Batman Forever with Val Kilmer, Batman and Robin with George Clooney are both totally alternate universes, like we visit one at the end of the movie. When they enter the mansion, they start playing the classic Danny Elfman Batman theme music, and the hallway that they walk through is meant to be all the same armor suits that they walk through during the Batman 1989 movie. The song that he's listening to on the record player is 25 or 6 to 4 by Chicago from the 1970s, because his Batman would have been a teenager in the 70s, like the younger Barry is still a teenager during this movie. They also have a funny joke about him painting in his retirement, but like super creepy looking paintings, like, oh, looks really weird there. The kitchen is meant to look exactly like it did during the 1989 Batman movie when they had dinner there, and the servant bells are a reference to his Alfred from those movies. When they make the Downton Abbey reference to the reason why Younger Barry doesn't recognize the show is because it hasn't been created yet. That didn't debut till later in our own real life timeline. They do have a joke about Arby's in this universe being called Abby's, like I could really go for some Abby's right now. During the movie, Michael Keaton also wears an ascot. That's meant to be a reference to Adam West's Batman who also has a cameo later during the big multiverse speed force scenes. They explain what they did to Batman, and Batman basically explains how Flashpoint really works with the spaghetti in a bowl. Like, you're causing all these timelines to overlap, eventually it's going to cause the multiverse to collapse on itself, which it almost does later in the movie. All the Superman jokes they make confirm there was never a Superman on Michael Keaton Batman's Earth, even though back in the 90s after John Wesley Shipp's Flash TV show started, they did a classic Justice League with all those characters at the time, but they never actually filmed any scenes together. When he mentions Super Batman, that character actually exists in the comics. It was part of a DC comic book story, like their version of What If comics, called Speeding Bullets, and it's the story of what if Superman's pod crashed in Gotham on the Wayne's property before they can see Bruce Wayne. They wind up being the ones to adopt alien baby Superman, raise him the way that they originally raised Bruce Wayne, even though now he never existed. They're eventually killed in Crime Alley, giving this new Superman character his origin story, becoming a version of Batman, so he never becomes Superman, he just becomes a version of Batman with all the powers of Superman. So he's a little bit more like the evil version of Superman, like the hardcore Superman in the Justice League Snyder Cut that winds up working with Darkseid because of the anti-life equation, except he's not evil, he's just very, very dark, like the 90s version of Batman. Like, imagine a Batman who's invincible, basically. Think about how crazy, how far he would go if he knew he were invincible. Even though Batman in the comics right now, without superpowers, also acts very cavalierly with his life. Like, he acts like he will never die. That's one of the cool things about the character. It's kind of like Daredevil in the Marvel comics. People that don't have superpowers, but also aren't worried about killing themselves. 
And the other thing you guys may remember, if you haven't watched that Batman 1989 movie in a while, is that when he's making fun of Superman for calling himself a Superman, there were jokes in the Batman 1989 movie about Batman calling himself a Batman. The way that Michael Keaton explains it, after the events of the Batman Returns movie, he continued having adventures, but ultimately wound up doing his job so well, Gotham became one of the safest cities in the world and no longer needed him to be Batman, so he just went into retirement for years, making these weird paintings and listening to 70s music. When they call him the best detective in the world, that's a reference to Batman in the comics being called the world's greatest detective, Batman also explains that he ultimately wound up being alone. So I think the idea is that if he did get back together with Selina Kyle at some point, because she survived the events of Batman Returns, Maybe she died during one of their future adventures together, but at some point long ago, he was left alone. They did do some Burtonverse comics for his adventures after the events of Batman Returns, so they did kind of get into some of the story of what he did in the future. And when I do my big deleted scenes video, I'll talk about the plans that they had to do a Batman Beyond movie, like a live action Batman Beyond movie for Michael Keaton's Batman, but they've canceled that since then. They go to his Batcave, which is meant to be an upgraded version of the original one from those original movies. They play more of his classic Danny Elfman Batman music, and when the lights turn on, a bunch of bats fly out just like they did in the Batman 1989 movie. They do that in all the Batman movies though, in all the different versions of their Batcaves, there's always a swarm of bats that just flies out. He's still got the exact same Batmobile, but some of his tech he's upgraded over the years, like all of his bat suits. The Bat computer has been more modernized, his Bat jet is new. They even make the obligatory joke about the Batmobile parking space. They've made several jokes about this all over pop culture since that original Batman movie came out. Like, should we put a railing around this? Like, is this kind of dangerous? There's just a giant abyss here that goes to nowhere. When he says there are tens of thousands of Clark Kents in the United States that he's trying to weed through looking for Superman, that's meant to be a reference to Superman's whole method for staying anonymous, why he chose the name Clark Kent, because it's so common. It'd just be easier to hide himself on official forms. And when he says he's searching in Kansas over the past 50 years, that's a reference to the Christopher Reeve Superman movie. They originally started developing the Christopher Reeve Superman movie about 50 years ago in 1973. Didn't wind up releasing it till several years later, though. Younger Barry winds up finding the Joker's bag from the Batman 1989 movie. In that movie, it was meant to be a reference to Joker's last laugh. Like, literally and metaphorically, he had the last laugh. Turns out Michael Keaton Batman just kept it for all those years. All versions of Batman, though, keep memorabilia from their adventures and their takedowns in the Batcave. Like the giant penny, the dinosaur, the comic book Batcave is enormous. There's tons of memorabilia all over it. When he falls asleep in the Batmobile with all the Twinkies he's eaten, that's also a bit of a funny reference to the Hostess branded Batman comics that they did back in the day. They used to do brand tie-ins for DC Comics, all comics in general, way back in the day. When he's holding the pen, that's also a reference to the pen that Alfred gave Michael Keaton's Batman during the events of those movies. And when he opens his suit vault, the key is behind a picture of his parents. But just starting with all of his suits here, the one in the center is the one that you see him actually wearing in the trailer. It's just meant to be his most advanced suit that he has so far. For the most part, they're all meant to be based on his same design language from the 1989 Batman suit. That's meant to be the one in the back left here. The one on the back right is the one he wore in Batman Returns. On the far left here, super deep cut. This is meant to be a version of his very first suit, like his Batman Year One suit. And the Batman symbol is also different from the others, if you couldn't tell. All the other Batman suits have the same symbol on it, except for this one. This is meant to be the Adam West Batman symbol from the 1966 TV series. The pistols are also meant to be grappling hooks, not actual guns, according to the costume designer for the movie. He also said he designed the ears for this cowl based on the Golden Age original Batman cowl from the comics. So it's like Michael Keaton's version of Robert Pattinson's Batman Year 2 suit, a very low-fi early prototype for what would become his 1989 Batman suit and other future suits. Speaking of which, for those of you that always wanted to see Batman in the movies wear the blue and gray suit from the comics, the one right behind this is the blue and gray suit from the comics. Ben Affleck's Batman also wears his own version of that in present day earlier in the movie. The next one on the back right is another huge deep cut for the Batman Returns movie. It's the underwater Batman suit that they sold as a toy, but he never wore in the actual movies. It was just one of the many, many toys that they sold as merchandise. 
Speaking of which, the last one on the far right isn't actually a desert suit, even though you see the goggles there. It's actually another one based on a toy they sold from the Batman Returns movie called the Arctic Armor Batsuit, and it was just for cold environments or cold-based villains like Mr. Freeze. Raise your hand if you spent all your money on all those Batman toys when those movies came out back in the day. Get those wonderful toys. They do pretty much the same thing for every Batman movie, but it was just special back in the day. There were so many toys. If you watch the behind the scenes features, they talk about all the merchandising they did for those movies. They made so much money on the toys for those first couple of Batman movies. Part of the reason for them doing such weird deep cuts, though, is to tell you what happened to Michael Keaton's Batman after the events of Batman Returns. When they learn about Supergirl being captured by the Russians and is being held prisoner, this is a combination of the original Flashpoint story and Superman Red Sun, which is basically an Elseworlds story about what if Superman's pod had landed in the Soviet Union and he was raised by them instead of the United States. During the original Flashpoint story, it was the US government that found Superman's pod and held him captive underground for all those years until they rescue him. Batman says one of his other iconic lines from the 1989 movie, You wanna get nuts? Let's get nuts. Then he had us. Now you want to get nuts? Come on. Let's get nuts. They have another reference to the Batman 1989 movie when they exit the jet and it illuminates the moon the way that it did in the original movie. Really cool in this movie and it was really cool in the original Batman movie. There's so many Easter eggs and references that they make like lines of dialogue or just funny jokes that they call back to from the 1989 Batman movie like when he's carrying people in the grappling hook asking them about their weight. How much do you weigh? About 108, I think. Hold on. When older Barry starts throwing up after younger Flash moves him at super speed, that's also a reference to Diggle doing that every single time that they do that on the Flash TV show. When they enter Supergirl's prison, you notice that her Supergirl symbol is the exact same as Henry Cavill's symbol because they are both from the House of L. It's the same symbol for their entire house. They explain that her backstory is pretty close to the original comic book backstory, like she's meant to be older than Cal L, Henry Cavill's Superman. He was a baby when she's about this old. She came to Earth in a pod to protect him, and he was meant to be much younger. But in this new universe, Zod was able to intercept Superman's pod before it arrived, killing baby Superman. So R.I.P. to Henry Cavill's Superman in the Codex from the Man of Steel movie was actually stored in Supergirl's DNA in this timeline, so they needed to harvest it from her. The whole thing with the Batman tape measure, I think is just a joke about all the Batman gadgets and toys and merchandise that they sold during the 1989 Batman movie. Seriously, there were so much merchandise and so many Batman gadgets all the way through the Joel Schumacher era of Batman through George Clooney and Val Kilmer's versions of Batman. They also kind of did this during the Adam West version of Batman where like everything just had a Batman name. Supergirl gains enough temporary strength from the sun to save them, but then passes out because she's still super weak from all those years in captivity under the red sunlight that they would bombard her with. During the movie, she never quite becomes as powerful as Henry Cavill's Superman, primarily because he'd spent all those years on Earth soaking in the yellow sun radiation, and Superman really doesn't have much of a limit on how much he can soak it. He's kind of like a solar battery, basically. So when he fought Zod, he was way more powerful because Zod had just arrived on Earth. And this is a big twist in the movie and one of the reasons why they can't defeat them because Supergirl doesn't become quite as powerful as Zod or the other Kryptonians. If she'd had a little bit more time to soak in more solar radiation, like a couple more years, she probably could have taken them down much more easily. Even though she does die during the events of this movie, that's meant to be an alternate universe completely. They are making a Supergirl movie now based on the Woman of Tomorrow comic book as part of the DCU, the connected movies, but they haven't said whether or not Sasha Kaye will come back as that version of Supergirl. Then Barry recreates the accident that gave him powers, and it's meant to be exactly like the original Flashpoint comic book story. They did it in the Flashpoint Justice League movie as well, too, where he tries to shock himself, almost kills himself, doesn't work the first time, and has to do it a second time. During the movie, you notice that they also use the Bat Jet to aid in shocking him, and the second time, Supergirl winds up carrying him directly into the path of the storm in the sky. Batman's whole speech about the death of his parents is meant to be similar to Ben Affleck Batman's speech earlier in the movie. He gives one of his old Batman suits from the Batman Returns movie, the slightly more armored versions, to young Barry to protect himself from those lightning strikes when they're trying to give older Barry his powers back, which he then later fashions into a homemade Flash suit. They reference Superman's S symbol, which is basically a scene directly taken from the Man of Steel movie about it meaning hope. Do you know what the symbol stands for? Supergirl? Means hope, right? Hope, yeah, does it mean hope? Yes. It's not an S. 
On my world, it means hope. Barry calls them the Justice League, even though they're short a goddess for Wonder Woman, a super mermaid for Aquaman, and the friendly Terminator is meant to be Cyborg. When younger Barry jokes about taking pictures of Supergirl to show their children someday, I think the idea is that at this point, he's sort of fallen a little bit for Kara's Supergirl, and he intends on marrying her instead of Iris West, like our children, which is why she kind of wryly smiles at the cockpit like, haha, yeah, whatever. Then when they start fighting Zod and the Kryptonians, pretty much in every version of the battle, ultimately they wind up losing to them, with one of them either killing Supergirl, taking the codex from her body so they can rebuild Krypton after terraforming the planet, but Batman also winding up dying somehow, either sacrificing himself or someone killing him. Younger Barry winds up making that Star Wars Emperor Palpatine reference when shocking people with his speed force lightning, and they're meant to be the exact same Kryptonians from the Man of Steel movie, if it wasn't obvious, because some of the big ones do come back directly. Most notably, Zod, Feora, and the big one is a version of Non. The way they're explaining the balance of power in the movie, though, is that despite all the Flash's abilities, both of their abilities, short of slaughtering all the Kryptonians by vibrating their hands into their hearts or their brains, they can't really kill the Kryptonians. They can only slow them down. The longer the battle goes on, the more powerful, the more unkillable the Kryptonians become. That's why during the original Man of Steel movie, Henry Cavill's Superman was able to beat them because he arrived just as they hit the planet before they had time to soak up enough energy to become so much more powerful or as powerful as he was. So the real lesson here is that you needed to fight them much earlier in the timeline. It takes a few mulligans from this battle for older Barry to realize what everyone's been telling him through the entire movie about not finding a solution for every single problem and learning when to walk away from things. Younger Barry has not learned this lesson yet because he's still a brand new baby Flash. And because of the way their time travel works in this Speed Force area, hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years go by. He says countless years that you can't even imagine. Tilly just ages into the Dark Flash, older version of Barry, like the Savitar version of himself. While they're coming to this realization, in the background of this Chrono Bowl Speed Force, the red tearing is the multiverse beginning to break down. This is where we start to get all the major cameo scenes that everybody's going crazy about on social media. All the different universes are represented by different colors, different globes. The colors themselves are based on the Green Lantern spectrum of emotions like green, red, yellow, white, blue, violet. Even though we don't see any Green Lanterns in the movie anywhere, I think there were some Green Lanterns as part of the script before James Gunn rebooted the universe and they removed a whole bunch of the footage. But the Violet universe is the one that the Barrys are in right now. The first cameo scene starts with the black and white universe. It's meant to be George Reeves' Superman. Also in it is a version of Jay Garrick played by Teddy Sears. Why is it Teddy Sears and why is it a CG version of him instead of archive footage? I have no idea. One of my biggest complaints about the movie is that all these cameo scenes could have been done using archive footage instead of really crappy looking CG. During their scene and during all the other cameo scenes, they also play archive footage from episodes or from movies, depending on what the cameo scenes are. The blue universe is for Christopher Reeve's Superman and Helen Slater's Supergirl, confirming those two characters, those two movies were connected. They also play a little bit of John Williams' Superman theme during that. The yellow universe is for Adam West's Batman. They play audio from him speaking in episodes and from his Joker laughing. The green universe is for Nicolas Cage's Superman, and this is a huge deep cut. You'd only know about it if you've been following all the Superman movies' development over the past 30 plus years, even the canceled Superman movies. During the late 90s, Kevin Smith wrote a Superman movie for Tim Burton called Superman Lives with Nicolas Cage playing Superman. They got pretty far into production before it was canceled. There was a huge documentary about it called The Death of Superman Lives. You can go watch it right now. During the cameo scene, he's fighting a giant robot spider because in the original movie script, he was fighting a giant robot spider. And the funny reason for this, as ridiculous as it seems, the big villain in the movie being a giant robot spider, at the time, the producer on the movie was John Peters, and he was obsessed, obsessed with the idea of Superman fighting a giant robot spider. Later, they wound up using it in the Wild Wild West movie, which is why at the end of that film, you see them fight a giant robot spider. The way he fights the giant spider and the little spiders all over his body is meant to be taken directly from the concept art developed for that movie. I can only imagine Kevin Smith just going crazy in the movie theater when he saw this, like, oh my god, this is amazing. They never wind up showing who was in the Red Universe, so I'm going to assume that that was meant to be Grant Gustin's Flash universe for the Arrowverse. And it actually winds up being the younger alternate version of himself that winds up taking care of his older self, like the Savitar version, the Dark Flash version of them. 
sacrificing himself to save the main Flash. And because Dark Flash is basically the older version of that younger Barry, they both wind up canceling each other out, essentially. So the whole idea is that the Dark Flash dies at the end of this movie. He's erased from existence, so technically he never existed. That means that in that particular timeline, that version of Barry winds up dying. Zod takes over that Earth. Supergirl died. Michael Keaton's Batman died. And that universe just continues on in its own timeline. R.I.P. to that version of Earth. The main Flash travels back to his original timeline trying to undo what he did saving his mother. So ultimately, she does wind up dying. Like He takes the can of tomatoes out of his mother's shopping cart. As he says goodbye, he makes another smaller change to the past by moving the can of tomatoes that his father got to a higher shelf. So the CCTV camera footage will pick up his father's face, exonerating him in present day during his trial. So he'll get out of prison. Once he gets back to his apartment in present day where he left, everything seems exactly the same as it was as his apartment. As he rushes to the courthouse to watch his father be exonerated, hoping that it'll work this time, he passes by director Andy Muschietti in another cameo scene, stealing his hot dog. Then when his father's exonerated, when he goes to the courthouse steps with Iris West, he tells the reporters basically a version of his story about the spaghetti, the timelines that Michael Keaton Batman told him earlier, basically telling all the reporters in broad daylight exactly what happened without getting into too much detail. Like, here's what I did, changing the timelines, but using very vague spaghetti terms. He gets the date with Iris West, finally. And as Batman calls him to come celebrate with him, like, yay, this is wonderful, his voice on the phone sounds almost the exact same. And as he pulls up in that same custom Mercedes-Benz Maybach, out steps George Clooney's Batman from Batman and Robin. There was a huge reaction in my theater the first two times I watched this. I saw it at a couple different screenings, and both times people went crazy when George Clooney's face showed up. Barry winds up dropping an F-bomb, like, who the hell is this guy? He says Batman out loud, not quietly, in broad daylight. Like, there's reporters walking all around them, and he's like, wait a minute, you're not Batman. And George Clooney's Batman kind of leans in, knowingly like, yes, of course, I'm not Batman. Smiling at him like, please stop telling everybody that I'm Batman. And there'll be some questions about this, too, because Barry's tooth falls out again. So I know people will be like, wait a minute, does that mean that he lost his powers again, like he lost him when he got stuck in that other alternate timeline? This time, it's meant to be more of a joke, like he still has his powers because clearly he talks about them during the actual post credit scene. But the idea is that you can hurt the Flash badly enough that it wounds him and takes time for him to heal. His tooth is fine again by the events of the post credit scene. So the idea is that he just experiences so much acute stress so quickly, like, oh my God, what have I done? I've done it again, that his tooth falls out. The credits themselves start, and during the main part of the credits, it's just meant to be a version of his save from the beginning of the movie, where he's rescuing all the babies and the dog at the hospital in the Speed Force in slow motion, with the credits playing while everything is falling in slow motion. The actual post credit scene happens a short while later, like short time jump, with Barry drinking at a bar with Jason Momoa's Aquaman near his apartment, which is the same as his original apartment, like it's the same basic place where he lives. He says he can't get drunk because of the way his powers work, which is accurate. They had jokes about this during the Flash TV show in the first couple of episodes. And he's been trying to explain everything that happened with Flashpoint during the previous part of the movie to Aquaman, but he's gotten super drunk so he can barely understand him. He keeps mumbling to Barry about getting him more drinks, like get some more drinks and gives him one of his Atlantean rings, which Barry says is Atlantean treasure. Like I can't give this to the barkeep because it's worth so much money. It's priceless. Confirming that this alternate universe Aquaman, like this Aquaman from another timeline, is just like the one from the Justice League, or like the original Aquaman. Barry says they're almost home, and then he falls face down in a puddle, saying, no, 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 this is my home, because he's in water. Very, very dirty puddle water. With an exasperated Barry just kind of throwing his hands up, like, ah, oh, okay, whatever. And even though things seem pretty chill in this new amalgam time, like this new spaghetti timeline that he accidentally created with a lesser version of Flashpoint, just to be clear, they're not saying that Jason Momoa's Aquaman always became Aquaman on George Clooney Batman's Earth. It's a situation like happened previously in the movie where a bunch of different people's timelines all start overlapping together. In the idea of this new timeline soup that he created, this new alternate universe, alternate timeline, things aren't quite as chaotic yet. I know there'll be tons of questions about what this means about the future of the Flash and what's happening with these characters. Is he going to try and change things again? Even though it seems like it's just meant to be a funny bookend to everything, the idea is that for the foreseeable future, this main Flash here is going to stay in this new alternate timeline he created by saving his father and just learn to accept all the minor changes. Like, I guess I just have to live with this weird alternate version of Batman. Okay, whatever. 
because it does seem like he's still friends with this Earth's version of the Justice League. But just to be clear, he's not going to go back and undo his father's exoneration just to get back to that original Justice League Earth that he left from at the beginning of the movie. So he still has his powers, but he's basically stuck of his own accord. He chooses to stay in this new reality. There'll be a lot of talk about this too, because originally there was a very different ending with a very different post credit scene involving Henry Cavill's Superman, Flash getting warnings while he was in the Speed Force about a coming crisis on infinite Earths across the multiverse. That was what a lot of those cameo scenes earlier in the movie with the collapsing multiverse was meant to set up. I'll talk about that alternate ending, all those deleted scenes in some of my bonus videos this weekend because the movie started out being like four hours long and there were originally way more cameos, way more Justice League stuff, way more multiverse stuff, setting up future movies like Man of Steel 2 with Henry Cavill, Superman, Wonder Woman 3. And all that changed at the last minute after James Gunn was hired last year and decided to reboot DC movies, so they had to make a bunch of edits. So in the version of the movie that you'll all see in theaters, they wanted this Flash movie to end in a way that would explain how you never see the Ezra Miller Flash again if they decide to recast and not bring him back in the future. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references during the movie that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. You could watch this like a billion times and still find more references, but it's not quite as dense with Easter eggs and references as Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I still think that's the reigning champ in terms of Easter eggs. My videos for all the alternate endings, deleted scenes, alternate post credit scenes will post this weekend. Make sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Click here for my full post credit scene video and click here for that deleted scenes video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.